House File 2032, Senator Chamberlain. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Members, we have House File 2032. What this is is a continuing appropriations bill for the state of Minnesota. Um, members, I'm going to review this bill quickly. Make a couple of comments, and we have a we have a, an amendment to fix uh, a technical fix. So, members, this is uh, there's two one section, two sub three uh, three subdivisions. First subdivision simply establishes continuing uh, continued funding for state agencies. All state agencies will continue to operate. All services will be continue. We would continue to provide all services. Uh, operations that funding that was one time will remain one time funding, so that will not continue. And if the it, it, this will happen, if we do not have a an agreement, a budget agreement, as of July 1, 2019. If we do not have a budget agreement by July 1, 2019, then this continuing appropriations kicks in to continually fund state operations through the next biennium, 2021 biennium. The funding amount of this is the forecasted base. Rather, the, the February forecast uh, as of February 19, 2019, which would be the 45.5 plus the forecast. So members, what this would do is would increase uh, the 2021 spending appropriations by 4.1% or $1.9 billion. So the forecasted base is what would be spent for 2021 at uh, $47.4 billion, which is a $1.9 billion increase. There are no cuts to this proposal, to the agencies in this proposal. As I said, one-time expenditures stay one-time. Second subdivision talks about uh, that funding will not be reduced except to balance expenditures with revenues, and then only through consultation with the LAC, the Legislative Advisory Commission. Members, that is the uh, brief explanation of the bill, and that's what it does. It continues funding for state operations for uh, the next biennium if uh, we have some problems here. So, members, I have the A50 amendment. Mr. President. Senator Chamberlain offers the A50. The A50 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Chamberlain moves to amend House File Number 2032. The unofficial engrossment as follows, page 1, line 15. This is the A50 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Chamberlain. Mr. President, what this does is just changes the uh, date from February 19 to February 28. February 19 to February 28. That is all. Any discussion on the amendment? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm hearing it's not online yet, so we will, we will wait for it to come online. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I impose a call of the Senate for the duration of this bill. The Senate is under call for the duration of the bill.
Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and that the Sergeant of Arms be instructed to bring in absent members. On that motion, all in favor say aye. Opposed say no. The motion prevails and the Sergeant of Arms will bring in the absent members. Members, I understand the amendment is available online now. Uh, Senator Chamberlain. Yeah, uh, ask for a roll call, uh, Mr. President. A roll call has been requested. A roll call will be granted. Is there any discussion, any further discussion on the A50 amendment? Seeing none, the secretary will take the roll. All members having voted who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 65 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Further discussion on the bill, Senator Chamberlain. Members, this uh, proposal is about prudence, uh, common sense, and responsibility to the uh, citizens of this state. Um, you can hope for the best, but you should always prepare for the worst. Wisdom dictates that. Uh, members, work continues with the negotiations, as we all know. The conference committees continue their work. Most of the conference com committees, if not all of them, have passed and accepted over 60 to 70 provisions. They meet in committee, they meet outside of committee. But members, if that fails, prudence dictates in this situation, we have what we have, that we must be prepared, both this, for the state to continue its operations uninterrupted as it has in the past. The political reality is what it is, and we cannot deny that. We should always prepare for the worst. This proposal, members, protects state employees and continues to provide services to those people in the state who rely on state services, and it protects those who pay the bills. State employees will stay on the job. There will be no layoff notices. The parks will stay open. The nursing homes will stay open. And the beer will keep flowing and no interruption in delivery. This is prudent, wise, and responsible. Finally, members, there have been concerns that uh, thoughts, well, the courts could just take care of this. Well, I would not rely on that. The last case that dealt with this was in November 2017 that many, many of you remember. And relating to this constitutional language that we have, that no money shall be paid out of the treasury of this state except in pursuance of the appropriation by law. Chief Justice Gildea made it clear. In the face, quote, in the face of this unambiguous language, we have declined to order finding, even in circumstances where constitutional rights are at stake. So members, this is wise, it's prudent, it's responsible, keeps everybody in their place, services are delivered, parks stay open, 
employees stay in the offices and in the field doing what they have to do. Now, the funding is uh, still $1.9 billion more than the current biennium, but that's not the end of it. Negotiations will continue because many people in this chamber believe, and the other chamber believe that more is needed. So this is not to prevent further negotiations. This won't stop further negotiations. Negotiations will continue because this is short of some of many people's goals. Members, I ask you to support this. The House has had similar language in their bill, in their um, state, state gov on bill that Senator Kiffmeyer may discuss. But their, their position is to simply protect state employees, nobody else. We simply expand that language to protect all the citizens in every location who rely on these vital, critical state services no matter who they are and not just state employees. So members, with that, I will uh, close and ask for a green vote. Thank you. Scott. Members, we're on House discussion on House File 2032, Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to offer the A5 amendment. Senator Kiffmeyer offers the A5 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Kiffmeyer moves to amend House File Number 2032, the unofficial engrossment, as follows, page 1, line 13. This is the A5 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. And so, members, this amendment is a definition. It clarifies um, that the state agency means an entity in the executive, judicial, or legislative branch of state government to just be sure that those bases are covered. And then members, I also have a handout for you that shows, uh, because I'd heard some comments about wondering if the House would be interested in this. And because I serve on state government and familiar with the side-by-side, -side, I remembered that there was a section that only came from the other body, the House, having to do with employee salaries and benefits in event of a state government shutdown. Now, this particular language started out as only classified employees, but later on it was amended to be employees in general. But nevertheless, there was an opportunity to include the rest of Minnesota, but they did not. In the event of a government shutdown, it was just clear that it was uh, intending to be for the employees. And not only that, um, these uh, salaries and benefits, everything would also be uh, in a situation of their, where they would be absent from work. So they would not be at their job doing their work, but this would cover them when they are absent. So members, um, but the technical bill that I'm offering right now, the A5, is just to clarify the words uh, state agency. So members, we are on. And the I'd like a to ask for a roll call, Mr. President. We're on the A5 amendment. A roll call has been requested. A roll call will be granted. Discussion on the amendment, Senator Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr. President, Senator Kiffmeyer. This is a friendly amendment. Vote green. Any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, the secretary will take the roll. All members having voted who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 65 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Further discussion on House File 
2032. Senator Bach. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, first, uh, let me just say, some people have characterized this as a continuing resolution. And uh, I just want to be clear, that's not what this is. What this is, is a new two-year budget for the state of Minnesota. And what, what troubles me about the comments of Senator Chamberlain that negotiations are going to continue, uh, I've been around the world of collective bargaining and negotiations for a long, long time, longer than many of you have been alive. And what this appears to me, with my experience, is you're throwing the towel in on the negotiations. We're all done. We're throwing the towel in, and we're not going to uh, spend any more money than what the February forecast indicated is what the previous Biennium's budget costs going forward. If this was in the private sector, and this was uh, management and labor, uh, the collective bargaining unit negotiating this, an unfair labor practice would be filed. And the National Labor Relations Board would rule. I guarantee you they would rule this is bad faith bargaining. No question. And the notices would be posted that that side uh, violated the National Labor Relations Act. That's, that's what would happen in the private sector if, if one side made a move like this, where they actually went backwards, where their offer was backwards in what they had offered earlier. You know, but maybe this was the plan all along, that we would spend no more money than we spent last time. And I started to feel that back on April 1st. April 1st was the day that Senator Rosen brought her opioid epidemic bill to the floor of the Senate. You know, and I think kind of everyone agrees we have a huge problem with opioids in our state and probably in our country. And even though we all agreed, when the board lit up, there were six members of the majority party that voted no. And they voted no because they don't believe any new revenue is necessary to fund anything related to state government. No new revenue. And Senator Rosen's bill had $20 million of additional fee revenue to, on the people that sell and produce the problem drug. Shouldn't they have to help solve the problem that they are creating with what they are manufacturing? But those six people felt, well, we might have a problem, but guess what? We're not going to spend any money to address it. None. I walked out of here thinking that day, well, it is April 1st. Maybe this is just an April Fool's joke that they're playing on me, that, that we need no new revenue for the things the state government provides in our communities. But I guess maybe I was wrong. Maybe those six, when they voted no on April 1st, maybe they really mean it that there is no new money for our state budget, no matter how important something is, we're going to provide no new money. And maybe, Senator Gazalka, that's the challenge that your caucus is facing today, is that those individuals think that nothing we do deserves another penny, even something as important as trying to address the opioid problems that our state is suffering with. But, uh, Mr. President, I have a a couple of questions if Senator Chamberlain would yield. Senator Chamberlain will yield. And members, I just want to remind everyone, let's not uh, impugn motives of members on the Senate floor. Uh, that is uh, in the Mason's Manual. So let's keep the topic uh, to the discussion and the bill at hand. And let's not, take, let's not question people's motives on the Senate floor. Senator Chamberlain will yield. Senator Bach. Senator Chamberlain, I'm interested in lines 1.18 on your new budget bill, uh, where it says federal money that has not been appropriated by law, 
basically can't be spent. I said, uh, Senator Chairman, can you tell me what that means, that line? Senator Chamberlain. Uh, Mr. President, Senator Bach, it does not necessarily mean that it does cancel, but it has to go through uh, a review with the LAC according to statute. And I would add that uh, uh, motives, what Senator Bach has just said is conjecture and it's speculation. Conjecture and speculation on intent. There is absolutely no way to prove any of that. So conject and speculate all you want, but it is what it is. The words are what they are. You just, I mean, it's, it's faulty logic. And uh, to talk about what would happen in private sector, in a court of law, this is public sector, so we should be concerned with public sector stuff. And we're doing it here. And if you wanted to go private sector, then the court would never allow such conversation. So uh, we, it, it, uh, to your question, Senator Bach, the Legislative uh, Commission gets involved to make sure that, um, uh, that if there are questions about those federal dollars, that they'll be involved in the consultation according to statute. Again, members, I will remind you one more time, let's not question motives on the Senate floor. Let's keep the discussion to the bill in front of us. Senator Bach. Well, Mr. Chairman, it appears that under this one-page new state budget, uh, that this Legislative Advisory Commission has a lot of power uh, because federal funds that are going to come into the state, for instance, we're entering a tornado season. And uh, God forbid uh, Minnesota would be hit with some kind of catastrophic event. Uh, but if federal money came in to address that, I think there's a question about whether Minnesota could respond to that. So, Senator Chamberlain, as powerful as this group appears to be, uh, Senator Chamberlain, if you would, if, if you would yield, Mr. President. Yield, Senator Bach. Members, I just saw a member take a picture on the Senate floor. On page 15 of the rules book, it says during floor proceedings, picture taking by persons other than the accredited news or legislative photographers is prohibited. I know it's Saturday, but members, that doesn't mean we don't follow the rules on the Senate floor. Senator Bach, you asked Senator Chamberlain to yield. He will yield. Senator Bach. Well, uh, Mr. President, Senator Chamberlain, as powerful as this group appears to be, uh, Senator Chamberlain, who are the members or, or what's the makeup of this Legislative Advisory Commission that we're giving all this power to, to decide whether federal money should uh, be passed through to the state or, or not be passed through. Senator Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Bach, just as a reference as well, um, the same process we use now for the federal dollars, same process. So there's nothing different here. And Senator Bach should know who those members are. He's been in that position before. Speak, if I uh, remember this uh, six speaker, Majority Leader, um, relevant uh, finance uh, chairs, Senator Rosen, and I don't know who it is in the House, as well as, um, uh, and I don't remember the other one, but the same, uh, you should know that, but Speaker, Majority Leader, and the finance chairs, and uh, uh, nonpartisan staff. Senator Bach. Mr. Chairman, the other two members are the committee chairs of the House and Senate that have jurisdiction over where the federal appropriation would be spent. Uh, and it's an even number, bipartisan number of uh, legislators. I, I'm, I'm just pretty concerned giving a group of six people uh, the authority to decide whether federal funds are passed through to something uh, that somebody on that group might think is not important. And, and what if it is somebody views it as kind of partisan and that commission of six people deadlocks three to three and we can't access of the federal money for something like a federal disaster, or certainly it appears like we're heading for some difficult times in our agricultural community, and some federal money were to come in uh, to uh, help our farmers across the state. I'm just a little concerned about handing that kind of power uh, to uh, six people. But members, 
two years ago, we put a new state budget together for two years. If it was on your desk, it would look like this. This is what it would look like. It was 2,863 pages. That's what the current budget that we're in was. Now we're going to extend that budget, review nothing, review nothing in it, in those 2,600 or 2,863 pages. We're not going to review a thing that we did two years ago. We're just going to pass it forward. And after five months, after five months here, state budget is one side of one page. That's all the people of Minnesota get. One side of one page after five months of work. You know, if Senator Chamberlain would yield for one more question, I, I, Mr. Chairman, I have a question on line 1.10. Senator Chamberlain will yield. Senator Bach. Uh, Senator Chamberlain, line 1.10 and line 1.11 say the base level for appropriation that was designated as one time in last year's budget was one time in its nature is zero. So, Senator Chamberlain, can you tell me what that means, that things that were one time in this budget, this 2,863 2 pages, things that were one time in there, what does it mean when that language says it's now zero? Senator Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Bach, um, again, the, the, to finalize the last question, the federal appropriation, same process we use now, and if you think that that group has too much power, then you should suggest a statute change in, in the relevant statute in 3.3. Um, uh, secondly, the vast majority of federal funds are appropriated by statute, so it is not an issue there. Thirdly, to your current question, one-time spending means just that, members. The spending was created in the last biennium as one time. So I don't know how to redefine one time, but one time means one time. If it was not in the appropriation ongoing, it will not continue. It was a one-time appropriation for a specific reason, for a specific purpose, to do something very specific. So one time is one time. So, Senator Bach. So, Mr. President, Senator Chamberlain, one of the problems when I talked about we're going backwards, and it's an, and, and, and in the private sector it would be considered an unfair labor practice, is the earlier budget that your caucus presented to the full Senate for consideration had $232 million of new spending in K-12. This bill, the new budget, has zero. You've gone backwards, $232 million from your initial offer of going into the conference committee. And in higher ed, uh, and I know Senator Anderson probably would have liked to have had more money, but he got $100 million of new money for our colleges and universities. This new budget goes backwards by $100 million from your initial proposal in this session. I, I, I have a hard time seeing how that somehow is advancing the negotiations with the governor. And in Senator Limmer's committee, uh, Senator Limmer was given a target of about $25 million to address uh, the budget for the courts and the budget for our correction system. I think we should all be willing to agree we have a significant problem in our correction system with, with the safety of our state employees to work there and we need to add some additional correction officers and I know Senator Limmer was hoping to do that with his $25 million increase, but this new budget, this new budget reduces what we passed here earlier by $25 million in, in, in the other direction. So how this can be good faith is a mystery to me. And Mr. Mr. President and members, this new budget does make cuts in what was done in the last biennium in that in the last biennium, this legislature was trying to address the issue of school safety and try to make our schools, uh, <coughs> the, the, the environment on our schools safer. One of my school districts got 
a grant from the money that we provided uh, in the last biennium, in the last budget, of I think almost a half a million dollars to try and secure some of their entrances to make their buildings safer so parents would feel like their, their kids were in a little safer environment uh, when they sent them off to school in the morning. I think that was about $25 million that we spent in the last biennium on that. Members, this new budget has nothing for school safety in it. Nothing. So we're going backwards by $25 million from what we did uh, two years ago. Uh, the, the appropriation that was in last year's or the, the most previous biennium's budget for early childhood funding, that was one-time money too. It's about $50 million, I believe, if, I, if my memory is correct. Served uh, early childhood uh, programming, uh, pre-K we commonly call it. It was a competitive grant process. I think one of my school districts got some money uh, for that also. Served about 4,000 youngsters in their, their early learning years before they ever head into kindergarten. So this new budget of yours cuts early childhood by $50 million less than uh, we had in the previous biennium. You know, and college tuition is going to continue to go up because you've backed away from earlier in the session when you thought we should put $100 million into, into higher ed. You've decided, no, no, we're not going to put anything new into higher ed now. We're going to pass this budget, and there's going to be no money for higher ed. And, and another thing that's a bit troubling, and we tried to address this last year and didn't get to it, uh, you know, there were reports of incidents where our most vulnerable Minnesotans in long-term care facilities were experiencing uh, neglect, uh, and incidents were being reported to the Department of Health, and uh, so there was a bill introduced, and it, the issue became to, became to be called elder abuse, and I was hoping somewhere this year we would do something on that. We didn't get to it last year, so that our most vulnerable people, the families, would be sure that they were in a safe environment. And the House brought some language and some money to conference committee to try and address that. We did not. We did not. The Senate hasn't taken a bill up on the floor yet. We're running out of days to address an issue that I thought we all agreed we should do something about last year. And we're making no effort. You know, and I mentioned the, the, the money in the public safety budget for our correction system. I am absolutely heartbroken that two state employees that work for us died in the last year or so at work because we have not appropriated enough money to make sure that the number of correction officers needed in our prisons are adequate to protect not only the other prisoners, but to protect the state employees that are trying to provide the environment for these incarcerated individuals. And now we're backing away. No new money for corrections. Those state employees that work in those difficult jobs in our prisons, when they go out the door in the morning, their families have to be concerned about whether they're going to come home at the end of the day. And we all own that because we're not fessing up to the fact that we have a staffing problem in our prisons and we're putting our public employees at risk. And unfortunately, this new budget that you're going to pass has no new money for that. I think most of us think there's a problem there. I think Senator Limmer thinks there's a problem there. That's why he was given an additional target in that area. You know, there's, in the last biennium, we appropriated some money for broadband. There's a lot of talk about unserved and underserved areas in this state that need broadband. And just like when the country, through rural electrification, put, put power lines and power into places that were deep rural that didn't have a lot of density, uh, the Rural Electrification, electrification Act did that. And a lot of people have talked about we need an effort like that for broadband so that no matter where you live, you can be connected to the Internet. And the legislature, over a number of bienniums, 
has put additional new money into broadband to leverage federal money, to leverage providers' money, to leverage local money, so that we make sure that broadband gets built in areas where it isn't, doesn't economically make sense, where it didn't economically make sense to put power poles and electricity either. And in your new budget, even though the last budget had money in it, I want to say about $30 million or so, this budget, your new budget that you're presenting to us today, none, not a penny. Not a penny of new money for broadband. Even though earlier this year, when you brought a bill to the floor, you know, before the big April Fool's joke, or earlier this year, people, I think, thought we should spend some money on broadband. But now today, you're going to vote for a new two-year state budget that has no money for something like broadband. You know, members, I've been here long enough to, to have seen this kind of a stunt pulled before. I was here on this floor one time, and this happened one other time, and it didn't work then. And it won't work now. Because you will hear from Minnesotans that something has changed in the last two years, and you ought to make some little effort Members, members, there's a long-standing tradition in this chamber, custom and usage, that there's no props on the Senate floor. Let's follow that long-standing tradition. Senator Bach. Mr. Chairman, I looked in Mason's and in our rules, and I couldn't find that. But I'm it's not. It's a saying... long-standing tradition of this chamber. It's custom and usage. Custom and usage of the chamber. It's not so, in the rules Ms. or Mr. Mason's. Mr. Chairman, I'm not dissing or agree with you, but these are some of the bills we passed earlier this year. Other other budget bills that we now, this isn't, Mr. Chairman, these are actually Senator bills Bach, that we Senator Bach, let's stick passed. to the topic at hand, please. These are bills that we passed, a small number of them, and we're, th we're throwing them all in the garbage today because we're going we're gonna to just go with what we did two years ago. Well, Mr. Chairman, let me just encourage the majority party, the Republicans, get back to the bargaining table with the governor. There's time to get this done. Might not be time because you've run the clock out with the negotiations. Might not be time to actually get it enacted into law by Monday. But there, are, there, there should be time to get an agreement. Three days left. Don't throw the towel in on the negotiations and think what we did two years ago is good enough. Somehow in those 2,863 pages, there is something worth revisiting. And the state budget cannot be reduced to one side of a sheet of paper when two years ago it took us 2,863 pages. Mr. President, members, uh, I would encourage a red vote on this and strongly encourage uh, the majority, the Republicans, to get back to the bargaining table with the governor with some urgency and let's negotiate a compromise where both sides maybe are going to have to accept something they're a little uncomfortable with. It, with. And you know what? Everybody's not going to get everything they want. And the six people that don't think we need any revenue, I think, uh, are going to have to accept the fact that we're going to need some revenue in order to build a new two-year budget for the state. And I would say to Senator Gazelka, who's not in the chamber, if you can't count to 34, Negotiate hard with the governor. And when you get an agreement with the governor, if you can't count to 34, I will help you. I will help you with my caucus get that new two-year budget over the finish line. Members, please vote red on this stunt today. Members, are there any other amendments? Seeing none, the secretary will give House File 2032 its third reading. House File Number 2032, a bill for an act relating to natural resources. Third reading. Senator Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Bach. A couple of quick points, and I'll yield for others for comment. But um, just some uh, a few facts here. And we could hand out the spreadsheet, but we thought we'd save a little paper, a little time, a little money. But uh, Corrections receives a $12 million increase. K-12 receives a $711 million increase under this, under this uh, insurance policy, under this uh, wise and prudent, uh, responsible planning. Uh, so increases in both of those, increases in every agency, 
as defined uh, with uh, Senator Kiffmeyer's amendment. So they are not decreases, they are not zeros, they are not nothing. They are increases. When you increase state budget uh, forecast by $1.9 million, that is a positive, that is not a negative. It's not a subtraction, it's an addition. It's more, it's not less. Uh, if negotiations stop, that won't be because of this body. If negotiations stop, that's somebody else's decision, but it won't be because of this body. This body is negotiating, willing to negotiate, so those negotiations will continue. It will not stop because of this body. The alternative, the proposed alternative here, members, the proposed alternative here is that you're saying it's okay to protect, uh, in the case of a, a special session and uh, shutdown, it's okay to protect state employees, which is fine, but everybody else, just forget it. We're not going to do it. It's okay not to plan for disasters. It's okay not to prepare for problems. That everything in life you do, we just shouldn't be prepared. The grasshopper and the ant, right? We shouldn't be prepared. Just go about it. Don't worry. We won't prepare. That is the unwise position. That is the irresponsible position. That is the position that will lay off all those 35,000 public employees. And the court won't step in. As Senator Benson mentioned the other night in, in the finance, this is not a time to play chicken. Senator Rosen said, and we understand, this is serious business. That's what this is. Protecting state employees, protecting the services that people rely on, and protecting the people who pay the bills. That's what this is about. Negotiations won't stop from this body. Your alternative is worse. is to do nothing, sit on your hands, and play games with that, and just hope that it doesn't come to that. So members, I will yield and let others comment if they wish. Thank you, Pres Mr. President, members, for the time. Final discussion on House File 2032, Senator Newman. Mr. President, uh, I would urge the body to listen to what Cham uh, Senator Chamberlain has uh, said, and I would never, ever impugn the, ma the motives of the Senator from Cook. He has given an impassioned speech. Uh, he has talked with his usual candor. Uh, he has pointed out several items that uh, we should be aware of and pay attention to such as the National Labor Relations Board. He has talked about uh, a problem with the federal money. He has uh, talked about uh, the budget that we passed two years ago. He has talked about the adequacy of the budget going forward, which I will tell you I disagree with. I think that there's about a 5.5% increase in the budget from two years ago that we are proposing. Um, he has given a number of reasons as to why we should not pass uh, uh, Senator, Chamberlain's, uh, Senator Chamberlain's bill. And uh, although I have the utmost respect for Senator uh, from, uh, from Cook, I have to honestly say I disagree with his position on this issue. And I urge the members to listen to, Sem to Senator Chamberlain. We live in a different world now than we did when we had gone through prior special sessions and, and prior shutdowns. And we do because of the action of the Supreme Court of the State of Minnesota two years ago. After we out were out of session in 2017, the Supreme Court ruled in November 2017 in uh, the case against Governor Dato Dayton and his vetoes. And the date of that, that case is November 16, 2017, well after we were out of uh, session. And in that case, and this is the important distinction, members, we have to listen to what the Supreme Court held in that case because what What's being pointed out is we don't have any choice. We are reaching a point 
where we don't have an agreement between the governor, the House, and the Senate, and if we delay too much longer, it'll be too late. Because once we go past sine die, it is in fact too late to protect the people in the state of Minnesota in the event of, or, or from a shutdown. And the reason is really simple. And I would ask, please listen to this. The Supreme Court said that we begin with the governor's argument that the judiciary can order funding for the legislature as needed to perform its core functions. If you remember in past years, where we got into this spot, we would rely on the, on the court to appoint a special master who would determine what the essential core functions were. That is not going to work anymore because of this ruling in the Supreme Court. In fact, what the Supreme Court ultimately held in its conclusion is really telling, and this is what you've got to pay attention to. We conclude, the Supreme Court, we conclude the governor's line item vetoes of the legislative appropriations to itself were constitutional. The governor had the authority to do that. As to Article 3, we conclude that the Constitution does not allow the judiciary to order funding for the legislative branch in absence of an appropriation. What that says, if we do not appropriate money before signe die, the court doesn't have the constitutional authority to do it for us. We will run out of money on Ju June 30th and the government will shut down. It's that simple. Whether we like it or not, the position that Senator Chamberlain has outlined is absolutely accurate and we have to pay attention to it. And if we fail to pay attention to that, we will fail in our obligation to our constituents to protect them from this government shutdown. I don't stand in a position of leadership in the Senate. I'm not involved in the negotiations, but I do understand this court case. And I would urge you members to please pay attention to it because I do not wish to put my constituents in jeopardy by having a shutdown because this body failed to act on Sen Senator Chamberlain's bill. And I will vote for this because I'm going to see that do the best that I can for my constituents to see that their government doesn't shut down. Thank you, Mr. President. Final discussion on House File 2032, Senator Osmick. Thank you, Mr. President. I wasn't going to speak on this bill, but I feel I must. It hasn't had nothing to do with the bill itself. It has to do with impugning people's motives in this body. Uh, it happened twice. It happened right at the end, Mr. President, of the comments by the minority leader that there were six people that didn't vote for the opioid bill that for somehow that was because we didn't necessarily believe in new revenue. That's low. I have been very public in my district explaining why. And a lot of people actually agree with why I voted no. But to come to this floor and to use a vote and impugn my motives is out of line. Not only in that speech where my motives impugned, there were five others in this body that had their motives impugned. The word stunt was used. We have 58 hours left. That doesn't help. Also, the term in good faith was used. I listened to the speech. That's not moving the ball down the field. If any member of this body wants to talk to me about why I voted no on a particular bill or a particular item, happy to do so. But to come to this floor and question my motives or the motives of Senator Chamberlain is as low as you can get. And I expect more from this body. I hope I never pull a stunt like that. I hope I never impugn the reputation of any member of this body. But for someone to come down here and pull that, this is wrong. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. President. Further discussion on the bill, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President and members.
Well, I rise not to talk about uh, stunts or uh, casting motives, which we know is not in our Senate decorum, and that is something that I so greatly appreciate. However, I rise to talk about logic and faulty assumptions. Faulty assumptions are based on some faulty logic. And the conversation from the good senator from Cook was based on a faulty assumption. The assumption that I heard was that the bill before us today is the Senate's next budget. But the facts speak differently. Let's talk about the facts. Facts are, facts are our friends. It's, facts are important when one is determining logic or assumptions. Our assumptions must be, be, must be made upon the best facts available at the time. Well, let's talk about the facts, member, members. The bill before us is the forecasted budget for our next budget cycle. It is for $47.4 billion, about a billion and a half more than the current budget. And let's talk about some of those facts regarding what this bill is, this budget forecast bill that is $1.5 billion more than our current budget. It is not the budget that the Senate put forth. As was noted, the education budget that the Senate put forth was significantly more than the forecasted budget growth. Well, let's speak a minute about the education piece on that. The education increased budget forecast without any legislative action is $900 million of new funding, or about a 5.1% increase in our school funding. But that is the forecast number that is in front of us right now in this bill. It is not the budget that the Senate put forth. This bill is not the Senate's next budget. It is the plan B. Yes, we want and we are rooting for the three folks who are determining this next Minnesota budget right now. They've been in negotiations for long negotiations for several days. The governor, the speaker of the house, the majority leader of the Senate here. They're in that cone of silence. We don't know exactly what is happening. I tend to think the cone of silence and long negotiations are a good sign. However, the people of Minnesota deserve to know that whatever happens in that cone of silence in the next 58 hours, whatever happens or doesn't happen, is not going to turn off the lights. It's not going to put undue pressure on our core state services. And in fact, the lights on bill before you adds a billion five to the existing budget. Now that is not the budget that we will end up at. It is the plan B. It is the safety net. And in fact, it is incredibly important. We don't need our state agencies looking at sending out layoff notices. We don't want to put our schools in jeopardy of hiring the teachers that they need or retaining those teachers. So 
members, this is a very prudent, thoughtful position. Everything important in life, if something is important to you, you have a plan A and you work and work and work and work. And then you also have a plan B. That's why uh, people would have a rain date, for example, on a wedding. They're having their wedding outside. They don't control the weather, but they have a rain date or a rain venue. There are plan Bs. This is the backup plan. This is the plan B should our leaders come to some sort of stalemate. We do not expect them to do so. We do not think they will do so. But this is in our jurisdiction today. And make no mistake about it. It is not the final budget. But it is a budget going forward for the state of Minnesota until that time that our leaders get that final budget negotiations so we can finish our work here. I encourage a green vote. I encourage a green vote for responsibility and for peace of mind. Thank you. Final discussion on House File 2032, Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. President and members. And um, my speech got a little shorter from what uh, Senator Benson said, so that's actually maybe good news. I have, uh, we've been, priv we're privileged to serve here. And I think as people look, when they come from across the country and across the, uh, actually across the world and they see what we do here, we are really, don't think the same about a lot of stuff. But we're in a peaceable way able to uh, sort that out and come up with a conclusion. And uh, I just can't forget that uh, my birthday comes uh, in the month of May and actually lands on the 18th. And I spent many May 18ths here waiting for it to get done. In school, uh, it was the end of the school year. And now it's the end of session. I remember some of the, my best birthdays and some of my worst birthdays happening with some of the debate and the contention, particularly when I was over in the House. Some of the worst days I can imagine where we just, where it all collapsed. Um, but I, um, it, it's, uh, we're going to sort this out. And frankly, I'm glad we're doing this resolution today. Uh, I sat through a shutdown in 2011. I was on the inside. There was a cone of silence, and there was no air in that cone. It was not pleasant. You couldn't tell anybody anything. We couldn't tell people that we were working to the very end. The human service world did not shut down for one day, even though we were shut down for 22 days. We worked, and we worked, and we worked. I didn't drop her diem. The people couldn't get into the parks. The, uh, the drive-by little plaques had concrete barriers so people couldn't stop and look at a plaque. It was horrible. And I've come to realize over my years, Mr. President, the best I can do is the best I can do. And I try to always give it my best. And if there's some way I can assure that those families that are counting on going camping on July 1st get to actually go, they don't have to be worried, I'm going to do that. I saw the state employees, who I'm a big fan of, uh, during that shutdown time, crushed and scared to death that they wouldn't have their coverage for their insurance, that they wouldn't uh, be able to make the bills. And they've dedicated their time and their labor to this state at not very high wages, and they're remarkable employees. Uh, we saw the nursing homes concerned that they would stay open. The special master ruled that they would stay open. But by the way, this bill, this bill, which is just pretty much bare bones, is still a billion nine above last year's money, is not going to be the end. But if you care about nursing homes, this bill here with the bare bones it is is $68 million higher than the governor's budget or the House's budget. Because after the House and the governor raised taxes, probably more than any other year in the history of Minnesota, that's probably true. Uh, it's $6 billion or more, depends on how you add it up. $6 billion. They decided to cut nursing homes, $68 million. And if you haven't gotten the emails from your nursing homes, somehow they must have the wrong email because they're scared to death about that. And just I, for one, just as a side point, am not going to vote to cut nursing homes. And that's a reason to keep fighting a little longer to get the governor and the House to realize this is a really, really bad idea. This bill, ironically, fully funds nursing homes. So that's the, a bright light in it, not to mention making the other, uh, part, other parts of government not nervous. This funds the waiver programs. 
the people with developmental disabilities, when this, this funds the hospitals. This funds the expansion of the group that the, single, the able-bodied adults in, uh, who get medical assistance and the families who rely on Minnesota care. They won't have to worry if this becomes law that whatever happens with the drama of all the place here, some of those horrible mornings when I almost cried on the way home on my birthdays and the days I went home kind of happy, those, those horrible days when things break down, well, they have to worry that on July, July, July 2nd that they won't be able to go to the doctor and get the care they need. This is what this bill is designed to do. And I hope members understand that this is the beginning. This is a way to help people understand that we do care about them. We don't care about the politics. You know what my people like me to do? Get to work together and get things done. They're still cheering, but they don't want to be a victim of the process and have things like shut down and not enjoy the great life in Minnesota. So keep Minnesota open. We're going to vote for this today. I'm going to hope it passes, and I hope the House takes it up and gets this done so nobody has to worry about it, so the negotiations can continue so we can get the best education funding, the best uh, reforms we want to do, just so you know. We're scheduled to go back into conference committee at, at one hour after this is done. We've adopted 200 sections or more, irregardless of what side they came from, because they're good policy. That work will continue. I'm committed to that. So members, I urge a green vote. Thank you. Final discussion on the bill, Senator Westrom. Thank you, Mr. President and uh, members. I rise to support this bill to keep Minnesota open for the taxpaying citizens of the state. Where I come from, they would call this common sense. Common sense to not have government go into a shutdown on July 1st if there is not a breakthrough before that. We hold that card here today to keep government open, keep Minnesota open for the citizens as we fine-tune the final budget. But it's only necessary if we get to adjournment date on May 20th, which the Constitution requires we adjourn and leave this body. The legislative branch loses its ability to convene and finish any unfinished business. So if we don't pass this, that means a shutdown by those that want to vote against this and not have a plan B in place as an insurance policy. A vote against this means you do not keep Minnesota open if there's not a final budget deal before July 1st. And so for that very reason, this is common sense to support a plan B option with less than three days to go for the legislature to be able to continue convening now is the time. Some have said, oh, this is premature. Well, how much closer to midnight on Monday would you want it to be? This still has to go to the House and then go to the governor to sign as a plan B. The House has to pass it by Monday night at midnight. So members, this is very timely as a option. We still continue to encourage getting a budget deal done, but there is no reason we have to go to a shutdown if things aren't completed or agreed to by May 20th, next Monday. And many, many might say, well, we've, we've come close to a shutdown or we've had shutdowns in the past, and somehow it's worked out. Well, members, take heed to the Supreme Court decision from two years ago. Any prior shutdown had lower courts, many would argue stretching beyond what authority they had, but they found ways to try to have some emergency payments allocated. But those issues never made it to the Supreme Court members. The Supreme Court has given us fair and if they haven't wakened everybody up, they've wakened, awoke many people to say, that is what the Constitution says. Article 11, Section 1 I th is what the courts referred to as unambiguous. They don't have the authority to write budgets or allocate the money 
if the legislature hasn't acted? Members, it's unambiguous. So if we don't pass this today as a lights on approach, if July 1st happens and the governor does not call us back for a special session, if there's unfinished business, lights go off, state parks close, families' vacations, camping in state parks change, food, food handling licenses don't get administered from the Department of Agriculture. Members, don't give our authority and ability to finish this only to the governor. Some have said, well, it's too early, it's premature, the governor will call us back certainly in June. No, not necessarily. 2011, Senator Abler referred to this. Members, there was lots of earnest negotiations going on by House, Senate, and the governor. June 30th, many of us sat in the chambers until midnight, June 30th, 2011. I was here saying, Governor, call us back. We're ready to finish the deal. The governor refused, pushing the state into a shutdown, only to take virtually the same deal that was on the table June 30th and pass it 22 days later after putting all the citizens through that unneeded exercise. And so members, don't vote for a shutdown down by voting red on this continuing appropriation. Keep Minnesota open, vote green on this bill as a backup plan. It's only common sense in just recent history tells you a shutdown can happen if the governor doesn't call a special session and all things aren't concluded. 2011, we don't need that done over again. Prevent that, support this continuing appropriation bill as a plan B, as a solid common sense insurance policy for the taxpayers and the families across Minnesota. I urge your green support. Final discussion on House File 2032, Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't think it gives anybody any pleasure that we're sitting here having this conversation. But for me, the biggest reason to support this motion is that if we feel helpless right now because a handful of people are doing the heavy lifting, imagine how the Minnesotans feel. They're wondering if government's going to be open. More than anything, I think passing this motion today eliminates using Minnesotans as pawns, because that's what happens otherwise, is we start to mobilize blocks of Minnesotans and say, do this and do this and do this. And we have this real threat over their heads. They won't be able to go to the state park. They might not be able to get the title to their car. So we have not done our work here. And I don't think we should allow Minnesotans to become a pawn in this bizarre game of machinations and messing with people's lives. So I would urge a green vote. Is there any further discussion on the bill? Members were on final passage of House File 2032 as amended. Seeing no further discussion, the secretary will take the roll.
All senators having voted who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 35 ayes and 31 nays, the bill is passed and it's titled agreed to.